This is where we live from Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Lucy Nalbathanchel. This week, the Associated Press reported the U.S. would take in 125,000 refugees and their families in the next fiscal year that starts October 1st, with a special focus on several groups, including Central Americans and Afghans at risk due to their affiliation with the United States. Now, some U.S. citizens and an unknown number of Afghans are still trying to escape the country, now under Taliban rule. Today, where we live, we learn more about Connecticut's efforts to help Afghans. Coming up, we hear from two local veterans. One is a spokesman for Digital Dunkirk, made up of thousands of military veterans and government personnel working unofficially to help Afghans and U.S. citizens abroad. The other is now a pastor whose church is working with a local refugee resettlement agency to help new arrivals. First, late last week, Connecticut Governor Lamont announced 310 Afghan refugees will be arriving in our state, leading coordination efforts between government and community groups is Dr. Deidre Gifford. She's commissioner of the State Department of Social Services. She joins us now on the phone. Commissioner Gifford, welcome back to the show. Thank you, Lucy. Nice to talk to you. And for our listeners who have questions about how they can help, you can join us, 888-720-9677. That's 888-720-WNPR. Find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. I wanted to start by playing a clip from Connecticut Public Radio's Kamila Bajejo. She recently spoke with an Afghan man who's living in Connecticut, but he had sent his wife and young children back to the country to care for his ailing mother before the Taliban takeover. And now he's try- he was trying to get them out. Let's hear what he shared. I sent my uh, family like three or four times to the airport because and the old checkpoints are controlled by the Taliban. If they saw you, like if you have U.S. passport or U.S. Uh, documentation, so they're going to just rip off those and they're going to beat you. He eventually got his wife and two children out of Afghanistan, but they had to leave his mother behind because her paperwork is still pending. And so, Commissioner, uh, from talking with local resettlement agencies, how common is this where one member or some members of a family have been able to get out, but other family members have been left behind? Well, you know, Lucy, that very poignant uh, story that you just shared, I think, is an example of um, some of the hardship and trauma that the Afghan evacuees uh, will have faced in leaving their country. There are probably as many stories as there are evacuees, and many of them have faced not only years of war in their country, but also the trauma of the evacuation process. And so that's one of the reasons why Governor Lamont has put together this task force to make sure that we are prepared to welcome these Afghan evacuees to the state of Connecticut and ensure that their needs are met. Uh, This man was a former advisor for U.S. Special Forces in Afghanistan, and you mentioned uh, the governor announcing more than 300, I believe 310 Afghan refugees uh, coming to our state. Uh, And do we know about their stories? Have many of them fled because of their affiliation with the U.S. military, Commissioner? Well, we do know that many uh, of, of these evacuees were by our side during the war in Afghanistan. And I know that uh, your guests uh, that you'll have on later in the show can speak from personal knowledge about the risks that those individuals took uh, to help the United States and uh, the uh, personal stories that they have in wanting to come to the United States uh, for a better life. So, as I mentioned, I think there are as many stories as there are individuals uh, leaving the country, but we we owe them a debt of gratitude, and that's why uh, Connecticut is working hard to make sure that we have the resources in place to help them resettle here quickly and smoothly. Do we know when they'll be arriving and where will they be housed? I'm thinking back to uh, prior administrations when young migrants needed shelter or unaccompanied youth. And uh, there was uh, talk of of housing them in uh, state run buildings uh, or hotels, people's homes. Can you talk about the infrastructure that Connecticut has? Sure. So 
Connecticut has a long history of welcoming refugees and asylees to our state. I think there are approximately 500 Afghans, one of whom I you played earlier in the show, um, special immigrant visa holders who have already settled in Connecticut. <clears throat> but what we do at the Department of Social Services is we work with the refugee resettlement agencies in the state of Connecticut who really assist these individuals on their arrival with all of their diverse needs, everything from housing to education to employment to health care to clothing and food. And uh, these refugee resettlement agencies are very experienced in um, helping people from around the world find the resources that they need, including housing. So one of the things the governor's task force has done is set up a subcommittee specifically about housing. And that group is busy working with our refugee settlement agencies to locate suitable housing for these individuals. Our goal is for them to have housing, individual housing um, for each family that arrives um, so that they can begin to uh, put down roots, get employment, and uh, begin the process of uh, integrating into our our state. You mentioned the goal is for them to have individual housing, but in terms of resources and uh, the work that's still being done uh, to find that housing, uh, could there be a situation where they're in some type of congregate setting until they can find that that individual uh, housing commissioner? Well, it's possible, but like I said, the the refugee resettlement agencies um, have a lot of experience in locating suitable housing for um, for incoming refugees and asylees. So I think uh, they're busy working right now with landlords and others to identify housing for these individuals. But if there has to be on a temporary basis um, a, a place for individuals to stay comfortably, we'll make sure that they that those resources are identified until individual suitable housing can be identified. You're hearing State Commissioner Dr. Deidre Gifford. She leads the Department of Social Services, her department tasked with just coordinating all of the organizations and nonprofits, uh, also uh, state help uh, to welcome 310 Afghan refugees. Commissioner, I asked uh, when you expect them to arrive. What do we know? Well, as you mentioned, um, Lucy, we do know from our federal partners that we're expecting 310 evacuees from uh, Afghanistan, and we anticipate that they'll begin arriving in the next several weeks. Uh, many have been flown already to the United States. There are approximately 53,000 individuals across eight U.S. military bases, and they're being housed there temporarily until they are um, then moved to their states. Uh, where they will have their um, initial resettlement process. Um, there are another 10,000 others who are in U.S. facilities overseas, and uh, they will eventually be uh, transported uh, also to the United States. So right now we know about 310 individuals, and I, and I want to say that this is in addition to um, the approximately 585 projected refugees and special immigrant visa arrivals uh, from all over that Connect is expecting in fiscal year 22. So I, I want to make sure and recognize our, the two refugee resettlement agencies who will be very hard at work assisting these individuals, and they are CIRI uh, in Bridgeport, that's C-I-R-I, and IRIS. Uh, in New Haven and Hartford. And those are the two agencies that are primarily working with us to identify and help resettle these families. There was a press conference at the Capitol uh, late last week, I believe. Uh, our report, one of our reporters is saying that one of these resettlement agencies says that they could arrive as soon as this week. Has, has that uh, been changed at all, Commissioner? Well, the, the uh, timeline is a little bit fluid in terms of arrivals. We do know that individuals are uh, having some initial paperwork and processing at the U.S. air bases 
excuse me, the U.S. bases. So, for example, they're having their security and vetting completed. Um, they are getting work documents completed. They are uh, receiving vaccination and health care screening. And, and then there's a bit of a period of quarantine after the arrival to make sure that individuals are, um, are safe from COVID-19. And then there are a few cases of measles, so they're making sure everyone is properly vaccinated for measles as well. So um, uh, all of those processes need to be completed before the individuals relocate to their uh, final destinations. Um, so it's just still some uncertainty as to the exact arrival dates. I wanted to take a quick call from Mike in Glastonbury. Mike, what's your question? Hi, can you hear me? Go ahead. Hi. Uh, so, Commissioner, thanks for the work you're doing. Um, you know, I'm working with my church on a resettlement uh, team. We've done this before through Iris with the Syrian family back in 2016, so we have some experience with it. And uh, a, a big difference, so we're ready to accept a family almost from Iris very soon. Uh, a big difference this time that we understand from Iris is that the Afghan families don't have official refugee status, most of them. And because of that, they're not going to be eligible for benefits like, you know, food stamps. You know, our congregation is raising a lot of money to, you know, get the effort going. We got an apartment and uh, we're going to, you know, be able to pay the first couple months rent. But having critical, you know, support from the state with things like food stamps is urgent, and it seems like it's up in the air. Can you respond with what's what you're doing and what's going on with that? Yes, Mike. Uh, first of all, thank you so much to you and your church and your community for the work that you're doing and have done to welcome uh, these these individuals to our state. I think it's that kind of volunteerism and kindness. Uh, that the, the governor wanted to uh, call out and, and um, make sure that uh, people know that Connecticut has a long history of, of uh, this kind of welcome. You bring up a really good point, which is that typically refugees and asylees are um, eligible for certain federal benefits if they have that official status. Many of um, the individuals arriving through this evacuation process from Afghanistan are uh, are what's called parolees, which means that they do not yet have official refugee or uh, asylee status. And they wouldn't typically be eligible for things like food stamps or Medicaid benefits. Congress, however, is aware of this issue, and there is a very active effort in Congress to um, uh, make a special exception for the Afghan evacuees and allow them eligibility for those programs. Um, we understand that that has a very high chance of passage in Congress, and that would, uh, as you point out, make a huge difference. If that doesn't um, occur for whatever reason, but like I said, we anticipate it will, um, then I know that the state uh, working together across our agencies and with private entities uh, will be doing everything we can to make sure that there are other resources available. Commissioner Gifford, before we let you go, I imagine some listeners uh, want to know how they can help. Maybe they're not affiliated with one of these uh, resettlement agencies or other nonprofits. So what can you tell them? Great question. I, uh, I strongly encourage individuals who'd like to do the kind of work that Mike is doing to contact one of our refugee resettlement agencies. They are in need of assistance. Um, they're in particular looking for donations. Um, that will help them resettle these families. Their website, CiriCT.org, that's C-I-R-I-C-T.org, and IrisCT.org, I-R-I-S-C-T.org. Again, Dr. Deidre Gifford is Commissioner of the State Department of Social Services. Thank you for joining us today. Thanks for having me on. This is where we live on Connecticut Public Radio. Coming up, two Connecticut veterans join us to talk about how they're helping U.S. citizens and Afghans at risk. You can join us too, 888-720-9677. That's 888-720-WMPR. Or find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live.
This is where we live on Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Lucy Nalbethanchel. Most Americans have no connection to the 20-year-long Afghanistan war. Beyond reading the headlines, perhaps shaking their heads at the way American forces were withdrawn and learning about the people at risk left behind. Veterans know firsthand about the challenges in Afghanistan and the promises made to Afghans who worked as interpreters and translators, among other jobs, for the U.S. military and its partners. This is why many U.S. veterans, including those in our state, have been working to help those stuck, stuck in Afghanistan after the August 31st withdrawal date. Joining us now are two veterans involved in efforts to help people escape the Taliban-led country and for those new to the United States to help them resettle here. On Zoom with us now is Alex Plitsis, a U.S. Army veteran. He was a combat veteran in the Iraq War, and he served in Afghanistan as a defense civilian intelligence officer. He's spokesman with the organization Digital Dunkirk, made up of thousands of veterans and government personnel working unofficially to help Afghans. Alex, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me. Also with us on Zoom is Reverend Thomas Burke, who's an Afghanistan and Iraq War veteran. He served in the U.S. Marine Corps. Today, he's associate minister at the Norfield Congregational Church in Weston. And with the church, he's working with the Connecticut Institute for Refugees and Immigrants, also known as SIRI. Tom, welcome to our show. It's wonderful to be here with you, Lucy, and you too, Alex. Now, our listeners can join the conversation if you have a question. Maybe you're wondering how you can help, 888-720-9677. That's 888-720-WNPR. Or find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. Uh, Tom, I'll start with you. You were a Marine Corps infantryman at an outpost in Afghanistan. So tell us how you depended on Afghans uh, in your time with the U.S. military. Sure. So at my local combat outpost, affectionately known as Common Sense, uh, right outside of the village of Nawa, Afghanistan, we lived with about 20 Afghan police officers. And so my platoon of about 28 Marines worked hand in hand day, a day and night uh, with these Afghan police officers um, who actually their, their language skills because of our interpreters got so well or so strong we could communicate and operate extremely efficiently because of the interpreter's hard work. And Alex, uh, the same question to you uh, during your time in Afghanistan. Tell us about your contact with Afghans and, and how they worked uh, with you or with uh, uh, your colleagues uh, during your time there. Sure, I think uh, very similar to the Reverend, although I'd also like to congratulate him on his Emmy wins earlier this week. So congratulations, Tom. Um, so the Afghans that I worked with, uh, in their roles as interpreters were extremely helpful. The same thing with the Iraqi interpreters that I work with as well, although the focus right now is on Afghanistan. Um, they were able to provide not only linguistic skills for translation, but also cultural understanding. And so that helped not only with communicating with folks to help get the work that we needed to get done. It also made sure that we were safe on many occasions, lacking complete situational awareness because we wouldn't you know, know the geography 100% well, the, the culture, who some of the players are. And so as I mentioned the other day when I was talking to, uh, to Reverend Burke, um, my life was saved on more than one occasion by some of the folks uh, out there, both in Iraq and Afghanistan. So I wouldn't be here on the show today without them. I wanted to hear uh, your personal connections, uh, Alex and Tom, because it points to uh, the work that you've been doing uh, to help those uh, leave the country uh, in those uh, very chaotic days uh, near the end of the withdrawal, but also, also even after those who are still stuck. Uh, Alex, do you see this as a moral responsibility to help them? I do. Um, you know, when I think the question you posed to the commissioner earlier was the right one. Um, you know, I, I want to just, if I can kind of ease into this for a second. The, yes, a lot of the folks who came over were not the ones that we intended to get in the beginning, uh, but that doesn't mean that there's anything wrong, that they were bad folks. These are Afghans who were fleeing the violence and the Taliban, and a lot of them did serve alongside of us, um, you know, which is why we're talking about this now. And we have a moral obligation to help them since they, you know, they saved our lives, but we, we made a promise to them as well, more than anything else. So, there's still 50 to 60,000 Afghans who fall into that category who remain stuck in Afghanistan at this point. We're going to continue to work to try to get them out. Uh, but we as a country made a promise. And uh, the, the program that you mentioned before, the Special Immigrant Visa Program, is probably one of the most unique in American history. So it was created by Senator McCain and a few others as legislation over a decade ago. 
And the purpose for which was to give those interpreters and folks who worked for us uh, in harm's way, uh, many of them seeing as much combat as we did, an opportunity to reward their, their service to our nation. And so when they go through full background checks, Homeland Security, FBI, CIA, NSA, all of our intelligence agencies is a 30 day clearinghouse. Usually I think they're being able to expedite it now by adding more people. These are folks who have passed the clearance, they've worked for us. And then when they get here, that, that SIV visa turns into a green card towards a pathway, pathway to citizenship because of the service that they've rendered to the country. So we made that promise to them through this program that if they, that, that they rendered service to our nation alongside of us, which they did willingly, we would take care of them and we owe it to them to live up to that expectation. Alex, I'm glad you brought up the SIV program, uh, the Special Immigrant Visa program. It has existed for some time, but I also know that this program has had a lot of delays in approving uh, not only Afghan refugees, but also those who served in Iraq. Uh, Tom, can you talk about that? I mean, now a lot of Americans are paying attention to this, uh, this special relationship that the military has with the people that helped them while they were over there. But this is something that's been going on for the last two decades, uh, helping to get into interpreters and translators here. Yeah, it, it, again, I, I echo Alex's comment. It's one of the most successful and unique um, visa programs that we have come up with to really honor and celebrate the sacrifice that these interpreters and Afghans and Iraqis made when they put place their bet on U.S. forces. Um, I, I have had a lot of stories in the last few weeks of people looking for P2 visas, being having employment uh, verification signed, and running into a lot of uh, bureaucratic uh, red tape that prevents them from really verifying uh, whether it be their service or whether it be their threat. And so there have been a few hangups, but again, I, I do want to echo uh, the legislative efforts that Congress put forward on a bipartisan basis to really make this special immigrant visa program a success has been really monumental. And again, like you said, I think getting attention to the, uh, the U.S. public will, again, increase this, uh, this really strong program uh, that's been created and codified to, to again, honor and celebrate uh, those who really sa sacrificed so much for us. You're hearing Reverend Thomas Burke here on Where We Live. He's an Iraq and Afghanistan war veteran. Uh, he's working to help a local resettlement agency with Afghan refugees expected to be here uh, in the next few weeks in our state. Also, Alex Pletsis, uh, who is spokesman with this organization, Digital Dunkirk. He's also a veteran. Uh, Digital Dunkirk working unofficially, thousands of veterans and government personnel to help Afghans. So Alex, what has the last few weeks been like for you? Have you been sleeping? What have been some of the success stories of the people you're helping? Yeah, not a lot. I've been working about 20 hour days. Um, you know, I, I kind of just really want to touch on the point Tom made in the last question, if you don't mind, just for a second. Yeah, the SIV process has been sort of uh, plagued by bureaucratic missteps and uh, just the way it was constructed has made everything uh, very difficult. So as Tom mentioned, I'm you know, very much looking forward to Congress trying to rectify this through legislation because it, it, it is a matter of law at this point. And they were effectively put on hold for four years under the last administration. So uh, over the course of the last 10 years, the program has just been plagued by problems and a lot of folks are stuck as a result. Um, and that kind of is a segue to your next question in terms of what the last few weeks have been like. Um, my team has had a chance to kind of slow down. Uh, we're a smaller group within D Digital Dunkirk providing sensitive logistics on the ground, uh, you know, food, water, food, water, medical, uh, sensitive uh, uh, transportation and, and uh, lodging is needed. And so far, we've been able to calculate, we've re received about 30,000 requests for support. We've been able to provide housing at least at some point for 10,000 people. And we shuttled 6,000 people to the airport, including 1,000 Americans. Um, it's been, I guess there's there's kind of two periods. There's prior to 831, which is the official evacuation then post. So before 831, uh, this was really a matter of supporting folks who were trying to get to the airport as part of the official evacuation operation where the State Department said, hey, we need, you know, X person, whatever your status is. If you fall in this category, you need to be at this location at this time with this paperwork completed. So in some cases, it was administrative support. Others, it was uh, literally logistics in terms of helping them navigate, sometimes picking them up or, you know, housing them temporarily, you know, to get them safe. So but all of it with the end goal of getting to the airport uh, and to support an official U.S. government operation. Since 831, there is no one left uh, in terms of government presence, State Department, DOD, or anyone else for that matter. And so 
we've continued the efforts that I just discussed, uh, and then we are working with government partners uh, on options for evacuation through official channels. As you've seen, a number of flights have gotten out. So um, that really is focused mainly on American citizens and green card holders, also known as LPRs or lawful permanent residents. Um, whether we like it or not, the Taliban are in control on the ground right now. And so they have the policy determination as to who gets in and who gets out. And so I know our State Department is still deeply engaged uh, with regional partners as well to try to bring that to a close so we can get more people out. But in the interim, uh, we're working to keep them safe in the uh, until that gets resolved. Mm. Well, when we talk about the work that you're doing unofficially, obviously, I understand you have to talk in general terms because we're talking about uh, people's lives and, and many that are still at risk. But when you talk about uh, the relationships you have uh, with fellow service members, people you've served with, people you've worked with uh, um, in D.C., you know, can you talk a little bit more about you know this the the, the, the massive coordination that sure. it's taking because uh, it's you know really remarkable. It's kind of strange how the whole thing came together. Um, you know, it popped up almost immediately after, uh, you know, it looked like Kabul was going to fall. It actually started as a West Point alumni group that then expanded uh, into more folks. And so um, as a member of the OSS Society, it's kind of a legacy Hall of Fame society for special operations and intelligence professionals. You know, going back through the history and legacy of the organization, because we all have ties to it, we kind of looked at what was going to be needed. So in my last position in the Department of Defense, I was the chief of sensitive activities within the Office of the Secretary, specifically for special operations and counterterrorism. So I had most, actually all of our national level uh, counterterrorism programs are basically black book of programs for the Department of Defense for acquisition and all kinds of other stuff. So between myself and another colleague, we got together and said, you know, listen, we understand the money, the authorities, the the programmatics and, and, the, and the technology or weapon systems that we have and don't have. Also, how long the bureaucratic processes step up to get all this done. We very quickly assessed that we were going to have a massive gap in capability that was not going to be closed anytime soon. And so we sort of got together along with a few other folks to kind of round out a team that included communications, um, operational support, logistics, finance um, on the political side. Uh, and we've had some interesting players that have kind of gotten involved. So my partner in crime throughout most of this has actually been Jake Tapper at CNN. So Jake provided me probably about the names of 50 Americans altogether that were part of family units that we were able to find in the middle of the night, get them moved to safe locations, and then eventually transport to the airport. Uh, that also included four underage children. Uh, this is probably, I think, one of the crazier cases I worked on. So I get a call from Jake on a Tuesday afternoon right after the uh, the city fell and said, hey, do you know about these four kids in Albany, New York, uh, or, or their mothers in Albany, New York? And I said, no. So the quick story is that the uh, the mother and father lived in Kabul with their four children. The father disappeared and was presumed assassinated uh, by the Taliban for working for U.S. forces. So their mother took them to Pakistan to file for asylum. While there, the father's family came and claimed the children under tribal law, which they were allowed to do, and took the kids back to Kabul against the mother's wishes. So she was heartbroken. She came to the United States to file her legal case to get her children back because she couldn't do anything for Pakistan or Afghanistan, for that matter. So two weeks before uh, the, the country completely collapsed, the uncle who had taken the children had abandoned them in Kabul. So they were 16, 10, 8, and 6. And so we were able to locate them. Uh, they were by themselves. Obviously, they could have been victims of trafficking, the violence, everything else going on. So uh, we were able to locate them. Um, I can tell you that trying to pass intelligence tradecraft through a mother, through an interpreter in Albany, relayed to children on the ground in Afghanistan at 4.30 in the morning so we could get them into vehicles and then also into safe locations was um, more challenging than I would have expected. <laughs> but we were able to to pull it off and then working with colleagues uh, and former friends from the, the Central Intelligence Agency as well as the State Department uh, to get the paperwork from the mom's attorney to prove a chain of custody because, again, since they hadn't been to the U.S., they had no paperwork. So they couldn't go through the Taliban checkpoints because they had no green cards or passports. So we had to work with through some of our sensitive government counterparts to eventually get everybody into the airport and get them flown out. And so those four children made it safely. Uh, they landed in Washington, Dulles, and then uh, their mom came down and we all met up at the airport in, in Albany, New York. So it was truly a, a pretty incredible experience. And it's just one of uh, several thousand stories. That must have been pretty emotional. What was that like for you to see them, your father? Um, unlike anything I've ever experienced, um, you know, this poor woman, Sunita, who's such a kind, loving person. And a lot of, you know, some of the news stories had left out that the kids had been kidnapped. They couldn't understand why the kids were there and the mom was in the U.S. She was heartbroken. I mean, it got to the point where she wasn't even telling people she had children because psychologically it was affecting her so badly. And so um, for her to really have her children back for the first time in five years since the youngest one was a baby um, was was overwhelming as a father, you know, of twins myself. 
And culturally, it's not really permissible for men and women to, to touch. It's one of those things where you don't do that, even in a friendly manner, if you're not immediate family. And so, I, you know, I reaffirmed that with the interpreter there because I didn't want to make it awkward as they got off the plane. And uh, Sunita basically came up and she gave me a big bear hug and collapsed in my arms and started crying. And I just kind of lost it at that point. Um, <laughs> it was pretty incredible. And I mean, our, our team's also kind of, you know, we've invested uh, basically the team dumped all their 401ks. So all the operations have been funded basically through 501c3 and we everybody dumped their, their own cash into it for the savings. So about five and a half million. So there's a lot personally invested from everybody on my team that's doing it as well. So there was, uh, it was truly just an amazing emotional experience. I don't know that I'll ever have anything like that again in my life. Well, thank you for sharing that with us, Alex. Uh, when I mentioned Digital Dunkirk, I guess I should have explained the reference. Can you explain that, uh, the, the name and why you call uh, this, uh, again, this mobilization uh, Digital Dunkirk? Sure. So I didn't come up with a name, but it is very, uh, <laughs> it's very fitting. So at one point uh, during the World War, um, the British troops were trapped in Dunkirk uh, and they were uh, basically pinned down at the risk of getting annihilated. And if that happened, the what was the remnants of the British army would have been destroyed and the UK would have been basically primed for an invasion and that would have been the end of it. Uh, but the government in the UK basically said, hey, civilians, all of you along the coast in Southern England, if you can get on your boats and go down and rescue the soldiers, please do that. And a massive uh, flotilla of, uh, of civilian boats. I mean, some, some were even pleasure boats that you would take out to take your kids, uh, you know, tubing or, or water skiing, that kind of thing. Uh, were used basically to go across the channel and rescue all of those British troops off the beaches and bring them back. Uh, and they were able to do so and prevent the UK from, from really being invaded and taken over. So in this case, very similar, where there was, uh, you know, an, an issue during wartime uh, where there was an appropriate uh, point where civilians could, uh, if you had the right skill set and knowledge, could kind of step in and help assist the operation that was going on to ensure that everybody got out safely. And it was all being largely done digitally. We do have some folks on the ground in Afghanistan. I don't want to get too too much into that, but um, majority of folks were all operating from their living rooms, like myself, or their offices, wherever they happen to be. So uh, all of this was done uh, digitally. So that's where the term digital Dunkirk came from. And Alex, for our listeners who want to help, uh, when they hear that people are uh, emptying their you know their savings uh, to help uh, Afghans left behind, uh, what are some ways that they can reach out to you and your group? Yes. So our website is, uh, and it's all spelled out, there's no numbers, it's humanfirstcoalition.org. Um, and there's an opportunity to donate there. Um, everybody is working for free. All of the money is going directly to food, water, medical, housing. Uh, I mean, we delivered two babies in the last three weeks, so that it's all going to a good cause. And we are still continuing to help Americans who are stuck in country while they, uh, while they find their way out uh, through official means that we are also helping to coordinate. So uh, any support is really, really appreciated. Thank you so much for, for offering that opportunity. I wanted to transition to, to Tom, who's still with us. Uh, I mentioned that you're a pastor now after serving in the U.S. Marine Corps, both in Afghanistan and Iraq. Uh, when, you're, when you hear about these efforts uh, from other veterans and the work that you're doing now to try to get places in Connecticut ready for these refugees, I'm just wondering what's going through your mind. Sure. So I, I just feel how much this demonstrates really one of the hallmarks of the past two decades of war um, has been really that moral injury piece uh, that veterans have experienced during combat in both Iraq and Afghanistan. And I have seen such, again, Alex has really led with this, such a bipartisan effort uh, across the aisle and, and throughout um, really polarization that veterans have united around refugee resettlement. Again, he mentioned, we made promises to these Afghans and Iraqis who served us. And so really, uh, again, spending 20 hour days, uh, going sleepless nights to be able to serve those who served us is providing this reconciliation uh, service. What it really does is it places a stranglehold on the ego and it prevents us from thinking about ourselves and it allows us to think about others and and treat them as they were created in the image of god and and truly deserve to be loved and supported uh, and and so i think this has been such a healing process for veterans to be able to serve those who have served us mm -hmm. When I think about uh, the long uh, history of communities welcoming new immigrants, refugees, and others, faith communities are so often at the center of this. Tom, can you talk about what your church is doing to help? 
Sure. So I, again, I want to celebrate uh, again, Commissioner Gifford and her efforts at the state, but also Mike and his church for the work that they are doing. And I do want to uh, celebrate so many others throughout the state who are working with their churches and in, in coordination with temples and synagogues and mosques to, uh, to build coalitions, interfaith, again, reaching across boundaries in order to serve uh, those who really served us. Um, these strangers, sojourners, we have a long tradition in scripture of providing and welcoming the stranger. Uh, Jesus tells us in the Gospel of Matthew that he was a stranger and we welcomed him. In Exodus, there, there are so many, so many rules about welcoming the alien and how that to not oppress the foreigner, that you yourself was a foreigner in Egypt. And so I, I think, again, building these coalitions, we're working very hard right now to coordinate with both Siri and Iris uh, to get the resources that they need to resettle these um, these refugees and these parolees. And that's looking for storage, one of the most important and critical resources. It's just storing so that we're ready for when these refugees and parolees arrive. There is this huge financial piece um, because, again, like Mike mentioned, there is sort of the anxiety of are they going to be able to access SNAP and these other, other federal benefits. And so we want to make sure that we can bridge the gap. There's, uh, there's the need for people to join teams to build apartments, um, to make sure they move all that furniture, to get apartments ready, to, to make a meal, a home cooked meal for the, to welcome these Afghan refugees and parolees. Uh, there's case management, there's vocational rehabilitation. Uh, one of the things that I've heard from so many congregants is how meaningful it's been for them just to, to drive a refugee or a parolee to a doctor's appointment, to, to connect with them. Again, that service prevents us from thinking about ourselves and it connects us with a humanity that is so much bigger than we can imagine. Mm. Before we let you go, uh, Alex, I wanted to go back to you. I know you've probably fielded this question many times because uh, you have served. And when we think about uh, the sacrifices for, of so many over the last uh, two decades, but what do you want to see happen in Afghanistan? So at this point, um, peace uh, under under any terms there. I think people there have suffered immensely. Um, you know, while we've been at war there for the last 20 years, um, you know, they were in conflict long before that. Much of the 1990s was spent amongst warring, uh, you know, warlords and the Taliban. Uh, many of the major cities were shelled. The civilians have suffered, you know, immensely through that period. And then before that, you had the Soviet war as well. So, I mean, the country's essentially been in straight conflict for the last 40 or 50 years. And so I would like to see an end to the, you know, the human suffering that, that's kind of going on. Um, you know, the right to self-determination. Um, is you know something we support uh, at this point. It doesn't look like the Taliban are going to allow that to happen, and so the the final disposition of what the government of Afghanistan looks like will be up to the people and the Taliban in terms of what they accept. And that's that is something that's difficult for for a lot of veterans. Uh, but that's the case, and that's where we are. Um, you know, we fought to a stalemate. Uh, you know, I still, as many, I think the majority of veterans and the public does, uh, based on opinion polling that I've seen, support the president's decision to withdraw. Uh, I think we've all got some issues with how it was conducted, but. Um, you know, that's Monday morning. And, you know, the focus right now is really on helping these people that are coming here. Um, as Reverend Burke mentioned, uh, you know, and, and a couple other folks as the commissioner, we have two world class, phenomenal resettlement agencies here in, in Syria and Iris. And so uh, making sure that they get support and the Afghans who get here get the support um, is, is incredible. I myself, I'm a first generation American. My father was born in Greece. Most of the veterans who were at the, the president, excuse me, the governor's press conference also fell in that category. And so, as the Reverend mentioned, we are we are a nation of immigrants, um, and it's it's always good to welcome folks here to add to our cultural experience. But to be able to do that on top of that for a group of people who not only share our ideals and values, but have spent the last twenty years standing by our side in the middle of combat uh, and not giving up on us is is truly a, a unique uh, experience and opportunity that I hope the rest of the, the the residents of this state will embrace and help us as we resettle the first three hundred and ten and any more that come. Alex Pletsis and Reverend Thomas Burke, thank you for your time today. Thank you as always, Lucy. I so appreciate your wonderful, wonderful journalism for us in this state.
This yes, thanks very much. Live. Thank you both. This is where we live. Uh, coming up after the break, uh, we're going to switch gears and talk to Connecticut's investigative team. Reporter Jacqueline Rabe Thomas will be here to talk about some recent education stories. We hope you stay with us. This is where we live on Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Lucy Nalbathanchel. The investigative team at Connecticut Public launched just a few months ago, and it's been doing great work. You're going to hear from reporters and the editor of the Accountability Project occasionally here on the show. A recent series focused on education. Joining us now with more in studio is Jacqueline Rabe Thomas, uh, investigative reporter with the Accountability Project. Jackie, always a pleasure to hear from you. Hi, Lucy. So let's talk about uh, some of the recent stories that uh, you've reported. And the, the latest one is focused on air quality in the state of Connecticut. What can you tell us within public schools here? Sure. So we know that the Lamont administration last winter surveyed all the school districts throughout the state just to see how air quality is doing. And they won't release those results that they have compiled. Um, all but 11 school districts responded, um, but the Lamont administration is of the opinion that they want to finish the final report before the information they got in from the districts is released. Mm. Now, why is that? I mean, obviously, living in this pandemic, good ventilation is important to prevent transmission of COVID-19. So if the state is looking to get data but not sharing, uh, you know, what's going to be the outcome? What are you hearing? So it's, a, it's especially important right now because we know that air quality is so important in schools and just ventilation in general is, is really important to slowing the spread of the virus in schools. And this comes at the same time that a lot of educators and school board members, et cetera, are really pressing for the Lamont administration to also pay for some ventilation upgrades um, in the data that was the last time the state did collect and release this data was back in 2013, and it showed dozens of schools just didn't have, um, you know, updated air quality systems. You know, we're talking about 50, 60, 70 year old systems here at times. And so, um, you know, public health experts will will tell you that, you know, that's from a different generation. That's just that's the, the quality of those ventilation systems just doesn't compare to something that's more recently installed. Let's talk more about the, the personal uh, aspect of the story, because you've spoken with teachers, including a woman in Stratford, about the conditions in the classroom. So what are they noticing? Sure. So in Stratford, I interviewed a teacher who, Kristen Record, who um, you know, every year when school would return, she would have seasonal allergies, or that's what she thought. Um, and then, you know, just on a suspicion, she started asking other teachers in the school, like, hey, are you facing th these same issues? And she found out that a, a, a large number of teachers were also having um, asthma, having, you know, coughing, migraines, those sort of things. And then so, you know, they sort of pinpointed the, the problem and it turned out that it was the carpet and the tile, the chipping tile underneath it. And so it took that to file a complaint that it was a trip hazard to get it out of the school, the to get new flooring into their school. Um, and they had to go sort of that route because there's no air quality standards in Connecticut schools. Um, Connecticut's not unique in that fashion. Only California and New Jersey do have air quality standards for schools. Um, but there's, given the growing awareness about the role that ventilation and air quality have, um, there is sort of a growing chorus calling for um, air quality standards for schools across the country and in Connecticut. So let's get back to the money question, because school districts obviously want the government, state government to help. But isn't Connecticut awash with all this federal money uh, during this pandemic? Uh, so what are the, the arguments that you're hearing from the Lamont administration about? Well, maybe they want to put the brakes on that right now, at least. Sure. So if you talk to local officials, they'll tell you that the federal money is nearly spent or it's just mm -hmm. not enough to even make a dent in the ventilation upgrades that are necessary. Um, 
the Lamont administration has put a $400 million cap on all school construction projects in the state. So we're talking about new buildings and major renovations, which is already a significant scale back from previous years. Um, so there's there's growing concern from school districts that the, the wait is pretty long to even get upgrades, you know, major renovations or new buildings in your schools. And then, um, but th- but that's not what they're necessarily asking for here. They're asking for, hey, earmark some money for air quality ventilation upgrades. Um, and, and, you know, to the point that there's federal money, um, again, it's not earmarked for an air ventilation systems. And so um, a lot of people that I interviewed said, you know, it's really hard to sell air quality as a pr- prior to the pandemic to get those upgrades because it's just not as imminent. People don't see that as imminent of, of a threat, of a risk. Um, so when you're talking about needing major funding sources for that, it's just not possible in some communities. We just have a couple of minutes left. Uh, Jackie, I understand that uh, the heat is still on the Lamont Astri- administration. Uh, is there more lobbying being done uh, from the biggest teachers union and others to, to get the, the state to contribute at least something? Yeah, so they are having a press conference tomorrow to talk about this and to really call on them to do this. Um, you know, I don't know if the Lamont administration will change their position on this. Um, they seem pretty firm that, you know, air quality has long been an issue long before the pandemic began, and um, they shouldn't be responsible for poor maintenance in, in their systems. Mm. And so at the end of the day, uh, if schools want to upgrade the system that's going to Go back to the the local taxpayers in terms of the budgets that might be passed, Jackie. Exactly. And so, you know, what the 2013 report from 2013 showed that, you know, in high poverty districts, you know, the towns that have are the least able to sort of raise that money locally, um, that they do that they tend to ha- don't have, you know, air conditioning systems, ventilation, you know, higher grade ventilation systems, that sort of thing. Um, So it'll be interesting to see if that trend has changed um, when the new report's released. Well, we'd love to have you back when that report comes out. And Jackie and the team have been, again, doing some exceptional reporting, especially on education. Uh, Jackie, looking at special education teacher shortages, also what's happening with disabled students and remote learning. So I urge our listeners, if you've missed any of that, go to our website, ctpublic.org, uh, to catch up. And we'll be talking with you soon, Jackie. Thank you. Thanks for having me, Lucy. Today's show is produced by Matt Dwyer. Matt Dwyer does great work. He's transitioning to producing in the afternoons, and it's been a pleasure to work with him on Where We Live. Thank you for today's show, Matt. Also, thanks to Tess Terrible, and our technical producer is Kat Pastor. You can listen to Where We Live anytime. Just download the show on your favorite podcast app. I'm Lucy Nalbethanchel.